is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative entrepreneur, find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and be the first to capitalize on new opportunities to make a living making your art. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, just hit subscribe on your podcast app. That'll deliver episodes right to your device. And to get your free creative productivity toolkit, sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. To follow a productivity system, you need to be able to trust that system. You need to be able to trust that if you put something into the system, it will get taken care of at the right time and the right place. But the flip side is that the more complex you make a system, the harder it becomes to follow and to maintain. And this is where building what's called triggers becomes invaluable in tweaking a system that works for you. Now, you've heard the word triggers a lot in the media lately. This is essentially the same meaning. A trigger is simply a stimulus that elicits a response. And you can use triggers to actually simplify your productivity system. Triggers keep your productivity system running smoothly. They keep your system from getting bogged down with complexities such that you aren't able to maintain that system. So in this week's article, I'm going to tell you exactly how to find the right triggers for you to use those triggers to be effortlessly productive. And I'd like to say thank you to those of you who are sharing Love Your Work and the heart to start on social media. I thought I would experiment with this. I'm sure I'm going to miss a ton of people. But on Instagram, we have Elena Denley shared my episode with Amber Ray. Elena said, this was great listening at Cadavy interviewing Hey Amber Ray. And then we had Vassi Churchy who shared The Heart to Start. Vassi says, you should buy this book, The Heart to Start, written by At Cadavy. An amazing book, really motivational. It's going to change my mind. Awesome. And we also have Anthony Catania Creates, who says, my reading for the first part of 2019, books by Paul Sarr, At Cadavy, and hashtag Stephen Pressfield. And Anthony shows a pile of books and says, it's going to be a creative and productive year. Awesome. Thank you to all of you. And also thank you to Kamga Chasa for his YouTube review of The Heart to Start. Kamga made a video. He said that The Heart to Start, quote, put me in a position where I was forced to take action on the things that I've said. I owe David Cadby a lot for actually letting me read this book. I think he's referring to the fact that he actually won the book in a giveaway that I ran several months back. Kamga goes on to say, I wish I could buy a copy for anyone who wants to start something. So thank you again, Kamga. And also Julian Power recently released a YouTube documentary called The Rise of Medellin as a Creative City. Julian, if you'll remember, is a Patreon supporter and was even a sponsor for a month. So go check out his documentary. It actually begins with a little interview of me, The Rise of Medellin as a Creative City on YouTube. And thank you also to Matthew Varghese for sharing his notes on the Productivity Cycles episode, which he seemed to like quite a bit. Matthew took some notes and shared them as a screenshot on Twitter so folks could get the gist of it quickly. Also, thank you to Kirill Shilov for sharing the heart to start in his post over on the Hacker Noon blog at hackernoon.com. I know that I didn't get everyone just experimenting with this. We'll see how it goes. If you have shared Love Your Work or The Heart to Start on social media, thank you so much for telling your friends and your followers. Your support really means a lot. You are helping me keep doing this work. I'm really honored to have the University of California, Irvine's Division of Continuing Education sponsoring the show. They have a ton of certificate programs and specialized studies programs available. You can do it on your own time. Advance your career in as little as six months. Spring quarter is coming up. Registration is open. Visit ce.uci.edu slash podcast and enter the promo code podcast for 15% off one course. Can you believe it? A university is providing a discount. That's ce.uci.edu slash podcast and enter the word podcast for 15% off one course. This offer is valid through March 31st, so do it right away. Okay, here is the article. Build foolproof triggers for a bulletproof productivity system. The purpose of a productivity system, such as getting things done, is to increase productivity while reducing cognitive load moment to moment. Yet for a productivity system to work, it also has to be manageable. If it takes a lot of cognitive load to interact with a productivity system, whether that's capturing inputs, prioritizing inputs, 
or deciding what to do, you're going to stop following the system. This is why triggers are so important to a reliable productivity system. Triggers reduce maintenance and clutter and allow you to trust the system so you can be in the moment. A trigger is a stimulus that triggers an action. For example, an alarm goes off on your phone when it's time to take a medication. Provided you keep your phone near you, you can be confident you won't forget. It also reduces clutter. Imagine having take medication on your to-do list along with everything else. That would be a mess. The trigger allows the relevant stimulus to be kept in its own place. The ideal trigger has four traits. It's reliable. It's context-specific. It's easy to implement. It is attached to the action. One, it's reliable. If you can't count on this trigger happening when you need it, you can't be in the moment. Two, it is context-specific. The trigger should remind you at the exact time and place and even mental state when you can take the desired action. No sooner, no later. It's easy to implement. Setting or following the trigger has to be easy to do or you won't be able to sustain using that trigger. And it has to be attached to the action. When the trigger happens, you don't have to do much to retrieve the action that needs to take place. I had a great trigger when I was a kid. I'd leave my backpack by the door each night, packed with anything I needed for school the next day. As I walked past my backpack on my way out the door, that was my trigger to grab my backpack. This trigger was reliable and context-specific because I had to walk out the door in order to go to school. The trigger was easy to implement. I had to put my backpack somewhere. It might as well have been by the door. The trigger was attached to the action because the backpack itself was the source of the trigger. While these are the ideal characteristics of a trigger, it's rarely possible nor practical for every trigger to have all of these characteristics to a full extent. In building foolproof triggers for yourself, you have to balance ease of implementation with other characteristics, as well as the likelihood that you need to deliberately construct a trigger at all. Here are some characteristics you have to balance to build foolproof triggers. There is mental load versus complexity, and there is distraction risk. Mental load versus complexity. Even my backpack trigger had some mental load. I had to see the backpack, recognize that I was, in fact, on my way to school, and grab the backpack to take it with me. It would still be possible for me to forget my backpack, especially if I was distracted. I could have reduced the mental load of the trigger by blocking the door with my backpack. But what about other people who had to use the door? I also could have set an alarm that went off right before it was time to go to school. There was no iPhone then, and if I had set an alarm for every little thing, I probably would have been shipped off to a mental institution. At some point, a small amount of mental load is good enough, especially when other solutions are impractical. You have to balance the mental load required to follow a trigger with the level of complexity required to make it foolproof. Distraction risk. My iPhone is the source of many of my triggers these days, but I try to avoid using my iPhone as the source of triggers whenever possible. The reason is distraction risk. Distraction risk is the extent to which the tool you use as a trigger source exposes you to getting off task. I find that if I have to interact with my phone in order to respond to a trigger, such as a notification or an alarm, I increase the chances that I'll get sucked into another distraction, such as Twitter or Facebook. For this reason, if I have to use an alarm to wake up, I use my iPad instead. I've set up everything on my iPad so that I don't receive notifications or social messages, so the distraction risk of my iPad is very low. There is zero chance that I'll waste the first hour of my day scrolling through Facebook. By the way, I would like to find a simple bracelet with a vibration function and a primitive LCD display, though it's possible vibration patterns could be enough complexity. If I could get triggers through such a bracelet, there would be no distraction risk to those triggers at all. There are a variety of techniques you can use to compensate for the mental load required to follow a trigger. There's habit stacking, and there's the trigger cascade. First of all, habit stacking. I learned in my BJ Fogg podcast conversation on how to build good habits that habits themselves can be triggers. When you use a habit to trigger another habit, you are habit stacking. For example, it was difficult to build a foolproof trigger for remembering to bring my lunch to school. I couldn't just put the lunch in my backpack the night before. It would spoil. If I wanted to hang a sign on my backpack, well, then I'd have to remember to hang the sign. And by the time I saw my sign, it'd be too late to make lunch. I still rarely forgot to bring lunch because, as I now realize, I was habit stacking. After breakfast, 
I brushed my teeth. After I brushed my teeth, I made my lunch. After I made my lunch, I put it in my backpack. I used things I was going to do anyway, such as eating breakfast, as triggers for doing things I might forget, such as brushing my teeth, I mean, hey, I was 11, and making my lunch. Next up is the trigger cascade. Triggers help reduce clutter within your productivity system. You can keep information relevant to actions in various places in manageable chunks. You can do this because of the trigger cascade. The trigger cascade is the arrangement of triggers in your system. One trigger leads to another trigger. Each trigger along the way presents you with relevant information. For example, my to-do list may have an action in it, and I may have a trigger to check that to-do list periodically. That action may trigger me to access a note in Evernote. That has further relevant information on the action, such as a checklist procedure that I can follow. There's no point in having the checklist on my to-do list. The to-do list item is enough to trigger me to look at the checklist. One trigger cascades into another. I personally have internal triggers based upon the time of day, even the time of week. For example, first thing in the morning is my writing time. That trigger cascades into me checking any notes I might have on things I want to write about. To build a foolproof trigger, ask yourself these questions. What is the action I want to take? When and where do I need to take that action? If I could implement anything I wanted, what would make 100% sure I wouldn't forget the action? Now, given the constraints of the context, when and where, what's a practical trigger I can use? And is there relevant information I need in order to perform the action? How can I silo that information so that I'm only presented with it as a result of the trigger? Building foolproof triggers takes time and experimentation, but it is worth it. With foolproof triggers as a part of your productivity system, you can operate fluidly throughout your day and focus your mind on what lies in front of you. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cadavy. This is a different kind of model for supporting the work that you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep love your work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cadavy. As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, V as in Victor, Y. And if you can't support the show financially, and you've listened to at least three episodes, can you do me a favor? Write a review on Apple Podcasts. You can consider it your donation to help support the show. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsors Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com and Paula Spriggs and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pinkovichis. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>